MSI's GeForce GTX 1660 Ti Gaming X graphics card is one of their top end models from the new 1660 Ti lineup. So let's take a look and see just how well it performs. To do this, I'll be testing gaming at 1080p, 1440p, and 4K, as well as overclocking, cooling, power draw, and noise levels to help you decide if it's worth buying. Let's start by taking a look at the card. Like other recent MSI cards, it's got a dark grey and black theme, nice neutral colours and should blend in well with most builds. There are two fans on the front, a metal backplate with a nice brushed finish and MSI logo on the back, and a single 8-pin power connector on the top. There's RGB lighting on the top and bottom of the card, and this can be controlled using MSI's LightSync software to change the effects or match it with the rest of your system. For the I.O., we've got three DisplayPort 1.4 outputs and single HDMI 2.0b port. The card is on the smaller side compared to others I've covered recently, just under 25cm in length, 13cm tall and 4.6cm wide, making it a 2-slot card weighing in at 869g or 1.9 pounds. The 1660Ti is Nvidia's first graphics card with their new Turing architecture to not feature RTX. As a result, it's both cheaper and branded as a GTX card. This also means we've still got the benefits of GDDR6 memory, of which there's 6GB, and here are the rest of the specs for that matter while we're at it. It's worth noting that this Gaming X card has a nice overclock on it out of the box, with a 105MHz higher boost clock compared to reference specs, so we're expecting it to perform a little better than many other 1660 Ti cards at stock. The system that I'm testing with has an Intel i7-8700K CPU overclocked to 5.0GHz in an MSI Z390 Gaming Pro Carbon motherboard, along with 16GB of TeForce Nighthawk CL16 memory running at DDR4-3200 in dual channel. Check the links in the description for details on all of the components as well as for up to date pricing. Let's start out with Apex Legends. I've tested this one using maximum settings and it was easily playable at both 1080p and 1440p resolutions. I could kind of get by with 4K, but I wouldn't recommend it with this card, although lower settings would go a bit better. Battlefield 5 was tested in campaign mode, and again it was running perfectly fine at 1080p, and still great at 1440p with high settings, able to average above 60fps. Again, 4K wasn't a good experience here with high settings, only just sitting on 30fps. Not good for a first person shooter game. Metro Exodus was tested with a built-in benchmark, which has been shown to perform below actual gameplay, so this is more of a synthetic test. I chose to test this way for when I do future comparisons, I can more easily compare results between different graphics. Plus, you can do the same test and compare. Far Cry New Dawn was tested with a built-in benchmark, and we're starting to see a similar trend, where this test was able to get decent frame rates at 1080p and 1440p resolutions, even with high settings, but then fairly weak performance at 4K. Far Cry 5 was also tested with the built-in benchmark, and this game gets higher FPS than the newer Far Cry New Dawn just covered. Although despite the small increase in this game, still not great at 4K in this test with high settings. Overwatch was tested in the practice range so I can consistently reproduce the test run. Even at ultra settings with 4K, the game was easily playable, with 1% lows still above 60 FPS. Not surprising as it's a well-optimized game, but of course much better with lower resolutions. Assassin's Creed Odyssey was tested with the built-in benchmark with high settings used once again. 60fps averages in this test were almost possible with 1440p, and then higher at 1080p, so both should play fairly well. 4K even wasn't too bad, as this game doesn't need a super high frame rate to play. Fortnite was tested with the replay feature, so the exact same test was done at each resolution with high settings in use. 4K wasn't too great here but it was playable with lower settings, otherwise 1440p and 1080p ran perfectly fine here. Shadow of the Tomb Raider was tested using the built-in benchmark, and this test is another example of one that was able to sit at 60fps with 1440p high settings, with fairly low results comparatively at 4K. Watch Dogs 2 was tested with high settings, and is another game that plays alright with lower frame rates, so the solid 30fps I was getting at 4K was playable with 1440p once more giving us that golden 60fps, even in this resource intensive game. Granted, this is also a CPU heavy game, and we do have an overclocked 8700K. Ghost Recon is another resource intensive game which was tested with the built in benchmark at high settings. And you're probably getting tired of hearing me say this, but above 60fps averages were possible at 1440p with higher at 1080p, 
while 4K wasn't good here. CSGO was tested using the Uletical FPS benchmark, and as a well-optimized game that runs on basically anything, I was seeing high frame rates even at 4K, definitely playable. However, we can see the 1% lows tank in this test, indicating the lower resolutions should provide a more consistent experience. Rainbow Six Siege was tested with the built-in benchmark, and is another game that's optimized pretty well, with 80 FPS possible even at high settings at 4K, with well over 100 FPS possible with lower resolutions. The Witcher 3 was tested with Hairworks disabled, and I didn't find it too bad at 4K. The 1% low wasn't too low, showing that there weren't too many dips in performance. However, it was noticeably better at 1440p or below. PUBG was tested using the replay feature with the same replay file between resolutions. At high settings with 4K, it was a bit choppy, and the average FPS is too low for a first person shooter anyway, but definitely going alright at 1440p and below. Shadow of War was tested using the built in benchmark and continues the trend of 60 FPS averages at 1440p with high settings in use, not so great at 4K and then around 100 FPS at 1080p. As we've seen, we're able to get some pretty good performance in the games tested. 1080p runs with great frame rates even with high settings, while 1440p is even playable in these titles with around 60 FPS averages or above. Some games were sort of playable at 4K, but this is definitely not a 4K card, at least not with half decent settings. I'd advise looking at something with more power for 4K gaming. Personally, I'd be after GTX 1080 Ti or RTX 2080 levels of performance for that. For overclocking, I've retested with Far Cry 5 at high settings. I was able to overclock the GPU core by 130MHz and boosted the memory core speed by 1000MHz using MSI Afterburner. At 1080p, there was a 3.3% improvement to average FPS, a 5.6% improvement at 1440p, and then a 6.5% improvement to 4K, as the graphics become less constrained by the CPU at higher resolutions. This isn't too bad, considering the card already has a pretty good factory overclock out of the box. So we're seeing some decent performance, but what are the thermals like? These are the temperatures I measured with the Heaven benchmark in an ambient room temperature of 26 degrees Celsius, on the warmer side as we've only just finished summer here in Australia. Despite this, the temperatures were still looking pretty good. A little warm at idle, but it's fair given the fans don't spin at all until around 60 degrees Celsius. By manually maxing out the fan speed with MSI Afterburner, it was possible to reduce the temperatures by 10 degrees Celsius. And my manual overclocks only raised GPU core temperature by 1 degree. Just for fun, I've used my thermal camera so you can see how the backplate looks with the stress tests running. It was definitely warm to the touch, but nowhere near as hot as some of the other higher end cards I've tested that need oven mitts. I've got the average and peak clock speeds while running the Heaven benchmark for an extended period, and with the 130MHz overclock applied with MSI Afterburner, we're getting a nice little boost. We can see that by maxing out the fans, we're able to boost performance just a tiny bit, as GPU boost prefers cooler temperatures. These are the average and peak fan speeds measured under the same tests as the temperatures and clock speeds just shown. At idle, they don't spin at all, so it was silent. And then they only rise a small amount with the overclock applied. I couldn't really tell the difference sitting next to it. By maxing out the fan speed, it does get noticeably louder, but I don't think it was that loud, considering I did this test with the side panel of my case off. Here's how these tests sounded so that you can get an idea for yourself. As I've got 7 other fans in the case, this isn't the best test. However, you can use the idle test as a baseline with just the case fans going and then compare the rest against that. I'll also note that while testing, I was not able to hear any coil whine with my unit. Here's what total system power draw from the wall looked like in the same heaven benchmark. So once manually overclocked, there was just a 10 watt power increase. For up to date pricing, check the links in the description as prices will change over time. At the time of recording, in the US, the MSI GeForce GTX 1660 Ti Gaming X is going for around 309 US dollars, or around 509 Australian dollars here in Australia. As for whether or not it's worth it, I think I'll leave that for the comparison videos I'll be doing between this, the 1060, 1070, and 2060 graphics, as I'll have a better idea of how it stacks up once I start comparing, so get subscribed for those. There are of course cheaper 1660 Ti options available. MSI's Gaming X appears to be their top of the line option for the 1660 Ti at the moment, so you can save your money and get a lower clocked out of the box card. Sure, it'll perform a few FPS slower, but there's a very good chance you can make up for that with some manual overclocking in most cases anyway. 
However, what you're usually paying for is better cooling. Extra metal costs more. I bought this one with my own money to have it available for future testing. Here in Australia on launch, it was actually priced the same as many other models that were clocked lower with worse cooling. I'm not really sure why, but for me it made sense to get this model. So what did you guys think of MSI's GTX 1660 Ti Gaming X graphics card? As we've seen, it's easily capable of 1080p gaming and even 1440p with higher settings. Let me know your thoughts down in the comments, and get subscribed for upgrading comparisons between the 1660 Ti and other graphics cards.